Man, how you feeling potential? Oh, you, come on, that was weak. You can do better than that. How you feeling this Sunday? Amen. I am so excited to get to share this time with you guys. And did you enjoy Watoto Children's Choir? How incredible and how blessed are we to be able to experience that. We're so honored to host them this weekend. And I'm just believing that it is gonna be a powerful time in God's house together. But before we go any further in service, I wanna take an opportunity. I wanna pray for our brothers and sisters in Israel. Many of you have heard as of yesterday morning, Israel has been under attack by an extremist terrorist group from Gaza and they've launched missiles. They've uh, taken hostage men, women, children. Um, there's already been those who have lost their lives. And you know, Israel is a chosen generation. When we look at scripture, it's a chosen nation. And I think it's important that as brothers and sisters in the faith, that we come together, that we pray for our friends over there in Israel. We have connections. We uh, know ministries over there in Israel. And remember, prayer does the heavy lifting. And when we get in spaces like this, a lot of times it, we can wonder, does prayer really have an impact? But scripture teaches us that prayer does the heavy lifting. And so if we could, with every head bowed, every eye closed, those in the room, those tuning in from the other side of the camera, from all across the world. Uh, let's take a moment, let's pray for the nation of Israel. God, we come to you now and we lift up Israel, Lord. And God, we pray for those who have lost loved ones, Father. Your word tells us that you are near to the brokenhearted, that you are the great comforter. So I pray that you would wrap your arms around them, God, that you would be their comfort and their peace during these days. God, I pray for, for the leaders, those in government, God, the military forces there in Israel, that you would strengthen them, that you would grant them your heavenly wisdom, God, to fight back against these attacks. God, I pray for the citizens. And God, I pray that rather than being consumed with fear, that you would fill them up with your Holy Spirit. God, I pray in the coming days that those who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior would come to the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, that they would repent from their sins and they would turn to you, that you would shake the ground with a holy revival. And God, we pray that you would send your spirit there and give us wisdom, give our world leaders wisdom to know how to respond. We know that you are supreme and that you are sovereign and that there is nothing that is impossible for you. So we call upon your great name. We call upon Jehovah that you would intervene, that you would intercede on behalf of the nation of Israel. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Everybody said... Come on, amen, amen, amen. You know, this weekend we are closing out our Colors series. And give yourself a round of applause for sticking with us over these last several weeks that we've been having some very hard conversations. And um, I just wanna honor our pastor, Pastor Troy, who has done such an incredible job of speaking from a place of bold authority but also from a place of love and tenderness. And it's been an incredible series. And this weekend is no different. We're gonna be talking about the value of life, the sanctity of life. Now listen, some of you in the room online, you are already ready to cancel me or to tune out. And I just encourage you, let's have an open heart, open minds together as we explore God's word. And some of you may be thinking, oh, here's another teaching on abortion. And while that is a portion of my message, that is not the entirety of my message. That's where I wanna land us, but that's not where I wanna begin today. Today, I wanna begin by talking about God's purpose for all of humanity. Have you ever wondered that? Why are we here? Why do we exist? I mean, why would an all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere at one time God create us mere mortals and be intimately involved in our lives? Why would he give us his word, his written revelation of himself? Why would an all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere at one time God care that we know him so intimately? Why would he go through so much pain and suffering just to reconcile humanity back to himself? There must be a point to it all. And together, I wanna dive into scripture and discover what the purpose for humanity actually is. And so if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter one, right in the beginning, we see God's intentional design for the human race. 
If you wanna follow along uh, in the t- with the teaching notes, they're there on the app and they're gonna be on the screens as well. But in Genesis chapter one, starting in verse 26, it says this, then God said, let us, speaking about the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, let us make human beings in our image. Let us make them to be like us. And they will reign over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky. They'll reign over the livestock and all the wild animals of the earth and all the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then in Genesis chapter two, verse seven. After God had made all of creation, he begins to form mankind from the dust of the ground. And it says that he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. And at the end of Genesis chapter one, if we turn back in verse 31, it says, then God looked over all that he had made and he saw with his eyes that it was very good. You see, there's a purpose as to why you and I exist. You know, my son, Lion, he is almost five years old and he is all boy. He loves to rough, rough house. And so we'll, he likes to wrestle and he likes to run around and, you know, we'll, we'll chase each other around the house and we'll, we'll wrestle and play fight and I'll grab him, you know, pick him up, turn him upside down, tickle him, all of that. And every once in a while, Lion will get so into it that he will take off running and he'll run into something or he'll trip and fall and he'll hurt himself and he'll get up and he'll turn to me and he'll say, dad, you did it on purpose. I'll say, lion, no, dad would never do anything to hurt you. And he'll cross his arms and he'll pout. He'll say, it was on purpose. And I came here today to remind someone in the room or someone tuning in from the other side of the camera that when God created you, when he breathed the breath of life into your nostrils, he did it on purpose. Turn to your neighbor, say, it was on purpose. It was on purpose for a purpose. And that's the title of my message today. He did it on purpose. Will you bow your head with me as we open up in a word of prayer? God, I pray over this message. I pray that it would not be my words that are heard, but it would be the voice of your Holy Spirit that is received. God, we open up our hearts to you. God, we ask that as your message goes forth, it should not return void. We ask that it would accomplish what you've intended, that it would bring forth healing and conviction and challenge. God, we are told that your word is powerful that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, God. So we've come today not to be entertained. We have come to be transformed. So as we open our hearts to you, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, that your Holy Spirit would deposit a seed into our hearts so that we would walk out of here transformed, different than how we came in today. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody said, amen. How many of you this week were at either our Forged Men's event or our She Night? Anybody? It was amazing, right? It has been a power-packed week. And Pastor Troy spoke on Thursday night to the men, and Pastor Steph spoke Friday night to the women. And they, sh- they shared a common story. They talked about Pastor Troy's driving ability. Do you remember that? Pastor Troy shared how when Pastor Steph questions his driving, how it makes him a little insecure. It makes him feel like less of a man. And Pastor Steph shared on Friday night that just getting into the car with Pastor Troy, just choosing to get in the car with him makes her fearless. You remember that? And I thought, you know what? Since I'm their oldest son, I should weigh in on this debate. What do you think? I think I should weigh in on it. I can attest, I gotta side with my mom on this one. Pastor Troy is a terrible driver. Anytime that I am riding in a car with him, if I'm in the passenger seat, I am holding on for dear life. Or if I am in the back, I arrive at my destination completely car sick. It's just, he has many gifts. Driving is not one of them. But listen, it would really be unfair for me to criticize him too harshly because I am my father's son. 
and I am no better a driver than he is. Just ask my wife. A few years ago, we were in Nashville, Tennessee, and my wife was speaking at a women's conference, and so I wanted to be the supportive husband that just travels along with her, prays for her, you know, encourages her, and uh, so I was driving, and she was in the passenger seat going over her notes, and we were on our way to this women's conference. And so I pull out of our hotel, not realizing that it was a one-way street. The traffic was headed in the right direction and I turned left. My wife did not notice because she was preparing her message. And it, I'll be honest, it took me about 20 seconds to realize that I was driving into oncoming traffic. And it wasn't until I see a semi-truck headed right for me that I started to realize I have made a grave mistake. And I'm, you know, like processing, trying to figure out, okay, what do I do? Do I just whip this car around in the opposite direction? Do I pull off, you know, uh, in, off to the side? My wife looks up. She sees this semi-truck headed straight for us. She throws her notes up into the air, papers flying all over the car. She grabs the wheel and pulls it over to the right. We whip the car to the right. The semi-truck passes us. And I say all that to say, never get in a car with me, okay? That is your fair warning. Have you ever had a moment where your life flashes before your eyes? It's like you are now questioning every single decision you have made in life. This was one of those moments. As that semi-truck is headed for us, I see my life flash before my eyes. And it's in those kind of moments you realize how precious life actually is. Life is a gift. Life is a reward, the scriptures teach us. And we see in Genesis chapter 1 that God places a high value upon life. He has an intentional design for the human race, but our culture doesn't always value life the way that our God values life. I mean, it's no surprise, especially after the year 2020, uh, that suicide rates are up. And I actually did some research and uh, I found a few statistics that I thought were interesting that I wanted to share with you today. And the first one's this. After declining in 2019 in the year 2020, Suicide deaths increased approximately 5% in the United States in 2021. The provisional estimates released today indicate that suicide deaths further increased in 2022, rising from 48,183 deaths in 2021 to an estimated 49,449 deaths in 2022, which is an increase of about 2.6%. According to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, in the year 2021, 1.7 million Americans attempted suicide. 3.5 million Americans planned a suicide attempt. 12.3 million Americans seriously considered suicide. And 48,183 Americans committed suicide. That's roughly one death to suicide every 11 minutes. And it's not just suicide that's cutting life short. If we look at the murder rates, the abortion rates, we see that in the US, the murder rate rose 30% between 2019 and 2020, the largest single year increase in over a century. If we look at the abortion statistics, in the year 2020, there were over 620,000 abortions in the US alone. And worldwide, it's an estimated that every year about 50 million abortions take place. That's approximately 125,000 every single day. Another interesting statistic, nearly 30% of women in the U.S. will experience an abortion by the time that they reach 45. So we can see from all these statistics that we don't always value life the same way that God values life. It's becoming something that is valued less and less and less. But there is a purpose 
for our existence. And we say it every single weekend. I know you hear it, but still every weekend I pray with people at the front of this altar that are questioning God's goodness, questioning his faithfulness, and whether or not he has a plan and purpose for their life. And I wanna remind someone today that you are not an accident. You are not a coincidence. You are not a mistake. You are not a byproduct of evolution, and you're not a result of biology. You were created in the image of God. You were created by a supreme God that plucked you out of eternity, positioned you in time for such a time as this to bear his image to a dying, broken, lost, and confused generation. There is a bigger picture to our existence. And so I wanna look at some scriptures that help us discover why we exist. And the first reason, according to scripture, that you and I are here is to have dominion. The Bible speaks clearly to that in Genesis chapter one, verse 28. And this is uh, God speaking about creation and he speaks to Adam and Eve and it says that he blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and every living creature that moves along the ground. And in Genesis chapter two, verse 15, it says, the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and to watch over it. In other words, he gave him responsibility to creation. God created you and I so that creation would have faithful stewards. God put you and I, the human species, in charge over all of creation. And the scripture is evidence that you and I are not like the animals. We're not like the vegetation. We are set apart. We were created different with a different purpose and a different agenda. God has given us authority and dominion over creation. I love that the scripture teaches us that we are to subdue it. And that word subdue, means to overpower or overcome and to bring something under control. And this is good news for us today because a lot of times life feels like it's out of control, right? But God has given you and I a divine authority to take what is out of control and bring it under the submission of Almighty God. You see, the good news is that even when creation became corrupted, when the fall of man took place, when Adam and Eve sinned and sin entered into the world and cast a shadow over all of humanity, it did not change you and I's identity. It didn't change God's mind about you and me. God gave us authority He gives us authority even over a world that is turned upside down by sin. We have authority that we possess in Christ. It has not changed God's mind about you. So no matter what state the world is in, no matter what's happening in the government, no matter what obstacles or challenges you are having to overcome right now, it has not changed God's mind about you. He has given you authority to speak to every hopeless situation, to speak Speak to every impossibility and every infirmity and command it to bow at the foot of the cross. Did you know even our speech has the power to bring demons into submission? Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 19, I love it. It says, when the 70 disciples returned to Jesus, right, they had gone out and they were doing ministry And it says, they came back and they joyfully reported to him, even the demons obey us when we use your name. And I just get this visual of the disciples like skipping back to Jesus, right? And they're all excited and and, and they tell him, they say, Jesus, you're never gonna believe what happened. We just casted out our first demon. Can you believe it? And you know what Jesus' response to them is, is he says, yes. He says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. In other words, Jesus was saying, I was there when Satan was cast out of heaven. 
I stood beside Almighty God as he casted him out of eternity. So none of this is a surprise to me. Satan is no match for me. And he says, and I have given you authority to overpower the enemy and to walk among the serpents and the scorpions and to crush them and nothing shall injure you. And this is a promise that you and I get to hold on today as disciples and followers of Jesus. We have authority over sickness. We have authority over depression. We have authority over bitterness. We have authority over affliction. We have authority over suffering. God has commanded authority to us so that we may not be overcome by the disappointments and pressures of this life. And rather than crumbling, we would see ourselves as we are in Christ, as co-heirs with Christ that have authority and dominion over a fallen world. Some of us need to start exercising our godly authority. We need to speak to depression and say bow at the foot of the cross. We need to speak to mental affliction and say bow at the foot of the cross. We need to speak to infertility and say bow at the foot of the cross. We need to speak to anger and rage and say bow at the foot of the cross. God has given us dominion and authority to overpower any challenge that we face. We were created in the image of God, to have dominion over creation, but also to reflect his glory. See, we're not meant to house the glory of God. It would be too much for our mortal bodies to take. That's why we see a lot of times a lot of spiritual leaders fall because somewhere along the journey, they stopped being reflectors and they started being housers of God's glory. We're not meant to house his glory, but we are meant to reflect his glory. Genesis chapter one, verse 27. Again, we've read it. It says, God created human beings in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. How incredible is it that we are a visual in the flesh of all the grandeur of God Almighty. I mean, how amazing is it that we are an illustration of God's goodness, God's magnificence, God's power? Are you starting to see how precious and valuable you are to God? And that was his intention from the very beginning before we ever took our first breath that others would look at you and see you in the flesh, but see God in the spirit. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the what things? Good, there's that word again, good things that he planned for us long ago. See, in Genesis chapter one, we read that God looked down upon all creation and said it was very good. And then in the New Testament, we read in Ephesians chapter two that he created us anew in Christ for the good things that he had planned long ago. And might it be possible that when God in Genesis chapter one looked down at all of his creation, all that he had made and said that it is very good, that he wasn't just exclaiming, at what he saw in the moment, but he was speaking about things that would come. Because we serve a God that does not work within the constraints of time. See, we see from beginning to end, but God sees the end from the beginning. He is already in the end. If you read the book of Revelation, if you read about the last days, if you read about when there's a new heaven and a new earth, God is already there. He sees the end from the beginning. And even though in Genesis chapter one, you and I had not entered the physical realm just yet, we already existed in the heart and in the mind of almighty God. And he said, you are very good. We were designed to reflect his glory and you can reflect God's glory right where you are. Listen, you don't need a different career path to reflect God's glory. 
You don't need a higher income. You don't need more connections. You don't need more followers. You don't need to change anything about your body in order to reflect the glory of God. You can reflect God's glory right where you are in the season that you're in, in the career that you find yourself in, even in your dysfunction, even in your brokenness, even in your despair and in your grief, you can still reflect the glory of God by living set apart. We reflect the glory of God because we don't talk the way the rest of the world talks. We don't complain the way the rest of the world complains. We don't condemn the way the rest of the world condemns because we see something differently and we speak something different out. Our words are not words of fear. Our words are words of faith. And as we speak out faith, we reflect the glory of God. Some of us need to hear today that it might actually be your brokenness that is shining God's light the greatest. The scripture teaches us that even broken clay pots can still be used by God. And maybe it is the very thing that you have been cursing in your life that God is using to reflect his glory across the earth. So, don't despise the thing that is afflicting you because it may be the very thing that is fulfilling the purpose to which you exist. We were created to reflect God's glory. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and, uh, through 17. We're told by Paul, don't you realize that all of you together as the body of Christ, you are the temple of God and the spirit of God lives in you. And God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. We are a temple for the Holy Spirit. And scripture teaches us that when we surrender our lives to Christ, when we give him control of our lives, we receive the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God lives and resides on the inside of us. And Paul is saying, do you not realize how valuable your bodies are? Do you not realize how beautiful your bodies are? You are a temple for the Holy Spirit. You see, our bodies came at a high cost. The word tells us that Jesus came to earth and he put on flesh and he performed signs, wonders, and miracles that ultimately led him to be crucified on the cross. He died on the cross, was buried in Joseph's tomb. He rose three days later so that all of humanity could be reconciled back to God. The Father and Paul is saying, your bodies did not come for free. They came at a high price. And Jesus thought you were valuable enough to die for See, we are reflectors of God's eternal glory. We were designed to have dominion, to reflect his glory. And then finally, humanity exists to be carriers of God's promises. And there are so many scriptures, there's a multitude of scriptures we could turn to to see how God fulfills his promises through the generations. And you know what, that's, that's the prayer that I have for my life, is that the promises that God has for me are so great and so grand that there is no way they could ever be brought to completion within my lifetime. I wanna see God's promises worked out through the lives of my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren and my great-great-grandchildren. There are so many scriptures that teach us that God works out his promises through generations. Even the book of Hebrews talks about the great heroes of faith. But it says, not one of them received in its entirety what God had promised. But they get to watch from a distance as God fulfills his promise through the generations. The word of God is filled with over 7,000 promises for you and I, but I wanna share just one of them because we don't have time to read 7,000 promises. But I wanna share one one word that's for you and I in Matthew chapter 16 that I believe is a culmination of all of God's promises. And in verses 18 through 19, Jesus had just asked, asked his disciples, well, who do you think I am? 
There's a lot of people talking about me. There's a lot of people saying different things, but, but who do you say that I am? And of course they respond to Jesus and they're like, uh, Jesus, you, you, know, you, you are the savior. You are the Messiah that we've been promised. And Jesus responds to one of the bold ones. He says to Peter, he says, I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on, excuse me, earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And see, even though Jesus was speaking to Peter, you and I are carriers of this promise. As disciples and followers of Christ, we are are heirs to this promise. Jesus is speaking to you and I as well. And what he's saying is I will build my church and establish my kingdom upon your shoulders. Through your life, I will make my great name known across the earth. He's saying to us that your life matters. See, you and I are our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren and our great great grandchildren and our great 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 grandchildren are all bricks that God is using with Christ as the cornerstone to establish his heavenly kingdom here on earth so it may be on earth as it is in heaven. And the scripture says, not even the gates of hell will be able to stop it. And a lot of times we can read that verse and think, oh, okay, the, the, the gates of hell, so God is protecting us from hell. But gates are a defensive mechanism. They are meant to keep something out. So what the scripture is actually saying, it's not saying that God is protecting us from hell. It's saying that when you have Christ in you, you can go up against all the powers of hell and hell will not be able to stand against you. Not even hell can keep us from the purpose that we have in Christ. Not even the powers of hell can keep us from our purpose. So before we discount the lives of a generation that is yet to be born, let's be reminded that they are carriers of the promises of Almighty God. And they may be the generation that brings heaven to earth. They may be the generation that shakes the ground with a holy revival. They may be a generation that restores a lost and broken and confused nation. They may be the generation that cancels out the schemes of the enemy. They may be the generation we are carriers of God's promises and there's no doubt that the enemy is after the next generation that is carrying the promises of God and abortion is one of those tactics and if we look at the stats and and I did some research I wanted to be prepared and I found some some interesting facts and this is one uh, according to medical news today. It says biologists from over a thousand academic institutions around the world assessed survey items on when a human's life begins. And overall, 96% of biologists and academic experts would say that life begins at fertilization. When the sperm meets the egg, 96% would agree that that's where life begins. I found another uh, interesting statistics. It says a baby's heart begins to beat between 18 and 22 days after conception, which is roughly around, you know, five weeks or so, which commonly uh, would be around the time that a woman would find out that she was with child. And I thought that was interesting. Okay, so five weeks, and I wanted to show you a circle graph of when most abortions take place. 43% of abortions happen within six weeks and 36 between seven to nine weeks. So within 10 weeks gestation is when about 70, uh, what is it, 76 or so percent of abortions occur. And I wanted to show you what takes place 
within the first 10 weeks of gestation. They're gonna put it up on the screens. We already talked about a baby's heart begins to beat on day 21. A baby's lungs are formed on day 26, 27 after conception. On day 36, the baby's eyes develop their first color in the retina. On day 40, the baby makes his or her first reflex movements. On day 42, the baby develops nerve connections that will lead to a sense of smell. The brain is now divided into three parts. On day 44, electrical activity is detectable in the brain. At eight weeks, the baby is now well proportioned and every organ is present. At nine weeks, if prodded, the baby's eyelids and hands close. And at 10 weeks, fingerprints begin to form. Did you know that there are no two individuals in this world that have the same fingerprint? Not even identical twins have the same fingerprint. Your fingerprint is unique to you. In other words, it is God saying, I made you and you are the very best that I can do. You're not a prototype. I didn't mess it up and need to recreate you. You are the very best work that I can do. And I'm gonna put a mark on you so that everyone knows it. And at 10 weeks, the baby's fingerprint has already been formed. And that is evidence that God has already called that child, gifted them, crafted them, purposed them. But within 10 weeks gestation is when the majority of abortions take place. And when we look at these statistics, it's no surprise that according to a study done at Laguna Treatment Hospital, they found in the women that they surveyed that those who had had abortions were 81% more likely to develop mental health disorders. They were 31% more likely to develop an anxiety disorder, 37% more likely to experience depression, 110% more likely to abuse alcohol, 115% more likely to commit suicide, and 220% more likely to use marijuana. See, abortion is an attack on what God created. And God takes that seriously. We see an example of that in Jeremiah chapter 32. Uh, Jeremiah was an Old Testament prophet who was assigned by God to speak to the nation of Israel who had turned away from God. And Jeremiah was calling them back to repentance. He was saying, guys, we have got to repent and turn away from our sin and turn back to God because if not, we are going to destroy ourselves. And he talks about all the different wicked acts that Israel was participating in. But in verse 35, he makes a specific point about this one. And Jeremiah says, he says, they have, or actually this is God speaking uh, to Jeremiah. He says, they have built pagan shrines to Baal, who was a false god. They've built pagan shrines to Baal in the valley of ben -Hinnom. And there they sacrificed their sons and daughters to Moloch. And I wanted to give you a visual of what this would look like. See, Moloch was a false god, the god of human sacrifice. And they built this statue of Moloch. And it said that right in his abdomen, uh, there was a ring that was, that was made out. They would light this ring on fire and they would quite literally throw their infant sons and daughters into the fire to be sacrificed so that they could be blessed by Moloch. And I wanna show you a picture just to give a visual of what this demonic statue would look like. And so the nation would gather around this statue. They would worship and they would chant and they would line up and they would take their children and throw them into the fire. And there's another picture as well that I believe compels emotion of a father handing over his child to a false God. And I think about that that father is searching for something. He's desperate for a touch from God, but he is looking and searching in all the wrong places. Now, all of us would probably agree that this is a horrible act. Even God himself said in Jeremiah 32, 35, I have never commanded such a horrible deed. 
it never even crossed my mind. Some translations say it never even entered into my mind to command such a thing. What an incredible evil causing Judah to sin so greatly. How overwhelming is it to think that apart from Christ and in our brokenness and in our desperate search for answers, we are capable of acts that are so horrific they've never even entered into the mind of Almighty God. Without God, we are capable of participating in things that even cause God himself to say, wow. And while we would all agree that that's a terrible act, right? And we may not today be sacrificing our sons and daughters in a ring of fire to a demon God. But might I suggest to us today that the enemy has convinced us that it is acceptable and should even be celebrated if we sacrifice our sons and daughters on the altar of convenience or on the altar of career or on the altar of even justice. You see, the enemy is very good at taking old tactics and disguising them with new fancy language. But abortion is an attack on God's purpose for humanity. See, we could debate all weekend long the topic of abortion. We could, and honestly, there would be valid arguments on both sides, whether pro-choice or pro-life. And I'm not really interested in debating because I don't think debates get us anywhere. But what I'm hoping we can all agree upon today is that abortion at its root, it's not as much a political issue or a women's right issue or an equality issue as much as it is a sin issue. Because any circumstance that an abortion would be necessary or desired or even justified would be a result of sinful actions. Whether it is a child that was created out of the context of marriage, the Bible calls that sin. Or if it's a situation where a woman finds herself pregnant, but she just doesn't desire a child, the Bible calls that sin. We are to rejoice in the fruit of the womb. Or maybe it's a situation where a teenager is raped. And we would all agree, God would agree that that is a horrific, sinful act. Abortion is a symptom of sin. And in all of history, guys, there has only ever been one solution to the shadow that sin has casted over all of humanity. And it is in the personhood of Jesus Christ. And I think that's why there's a lot of division within the church and within the world on this issue because we are looking for a logical, factual solution to a spiritual problem. We are reliant more on what we can come up with and manufacture in our own minds rather than what God wants to circumcise in our hearts. And I'll be honest, I don't have all the answers when it comes to this. When you ask me, well, what about a situation where the mother's life is in danger? Or what about a situation, there's a 12 year old, she was raped by her uncle and now she should have to live with this. She should have to give birth to this child and raise this child. I'll be honest, I don't have answers for all of it. And if I'm really being honest, there are moments where even I have questioned, is abortion a black and white issue? Are there circumstances where abortion actually seems justifiable. But what I've learned in my walk is that the way that I choose to live and believe is not based on my own understanding. I choose to follow God's word and in 31 years, it hasn't disappointed me since. See, I made a decision when I was seven years old to make Jesus my personal savior. And when I accepted Jesus into my life, it changed my life. That decision I made at seven years old is what gives me strength for every challenge I overcome today. But when I made Jesus my savior, I also made him my Lord. I gave him ultimate authority over my life. And back in the day, we used to sing a song 
was called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. It was an old hymn that has been modernized today. And I'm actually gonna invite my friend Clarence to come out and he's gonna sing a few words of this song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And so if you know it, sing it out with us. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. See, there's such power in those words. I made a decision as a child to follow Jesus, no turning back. And so we can't discount what God's word says about this issue. Because I made a decision that even when I don't understand, even when I don't agree, even when it doesn't make sense to me, God's word will be a light to my feet and a light to my path. And even though the Bible doesn't explicitly speak to the act of abortion, it does speak numerous times that God has great love for every life that he has created. And I'm just gonna read two of them to you today. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 18. This is King David, a Psalm of King David. He says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous and I know it well. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. And every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had come to pass. How precious are your thoughts of me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. They outnumber the grains of the sand. And in Jeremiah chapter one, verse five, God says to the prophet Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And this is a promise for every life that exists in the womb and outside the womb, that you are valued, that you are loved, that you are purposed, that God has a plan, that God has an agenda. Before even one day came to pass, God already saw it in the supernatural. So I would encourage us today, anyone that may be wrestling through a decision, there's no doubt. There may be some of us in this room right now, maybe we've not shared with anyone, but we're considering abortion or we know someone who is. And I would encourage us to look at these scriptures and be reminded that God values every life that he has created. So how can we knowingly put an end to what God is just beginning? Because here's the thing, God only does good things. He doesn't just do good, he is good. He is goodness. God only does good things and life is not always good. People are not always good. Circumstances are not always good. But there, if there is anything that our God puts his hands to. Romans 8, 28 says that he will turn it around for good and he will use it for good purposes. And what if that child that is in the womb is the very good thing meant to redeem your life? I wanna encourage anyone that maybe has committed the act of abortion and 
And statistics show that oftentimes that can carry a lot of emotions, some of which might be guilt or shame. And there's no doubt that there are probably some of us in this room and watching online and maybe for decades, you have carried a sense of guilt and shame over this. You know, Pastor Choi says so eloquently that the devil is pro-choice on the way into the clinic and pro-life on the way out. He convinces us that this is the right decision, that this is our body, it's our choice. And then on the way out, he floods our minds with shame and guilt and condemnation because the enemy does not want you walking in the freedom that Jesus died for. But someone needs to hear today, God forgives you. God forgives forgives you and today is the day that you forgive yourself and you begin to walk in the freedom that Jesus Christ died for you are his child he is filled with admiration for you friend it does not matter what sin you've committed God does not judge sin vertically he judges it horizontally for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard but because of his great love for you he sent Jesus to die a shameful death so that you would not have to walk in shame. And so today is a day of freedom. Life is a gift. God did it on purpose and he did it for a purpose. Will you bow your heads with me as we close? God, I thank you for your word. And God, even though that this is a word that challenges us. It challenges our bias. It challenges the way we were raised. It challenges our experiences. It challenges our logic. It challenges our politics. But God, we came here to be transformed because the way that we've been living life has not been working. So God, circumcise our hearts chip away at the callous on our hearts, sensitize our hearts and our ears and our eyes to perceive what you perceive. And God, I pray we would rise up and we would fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. May we not be a generation that sits back and says nothing because we're afraid of being canceled or we're afraid of what others will think or we're afraid of what will get posted on social media. May we be a generation that rises up and speaks the truth in love so that others will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We love you, we praise you, we worship you, we bless you, and it is in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said amen, amen, and amen.